Welcome to the playlist on free radical chemistry. You might also find this particular video in the Cytochrome P450 playlist. And the reason that you'll find it in that playlist is because this particular enzyme, which is called nitric oxide synthase, it is very much related to cytochrome P450, okay? It has a similar type of electron transfer capacity. Um, it has the heme B in there. And what we're going to find is when we look at the mechanism of this enzyme, um, it's going to resemble parts of the P450 mechanism, okay? So basically what we'll do first is really just go over the very general reaction, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a molecule of L-arginine. So that's what this is right here. This is the amino acid L-arginine. And we're going to use three halves of NADPH, in other words, three halves of the total electron reducing equivalents, two molecular oxygens, and we'll get out the NADP plus that corresponds to the NADPH. We'll get out two waters. This guy right here, which is called nitric oxide, so this is nitric oxide. And then we should also get out this guy, which is another amino acid. This is L-citrulline. L-citrulline. We'll talk about that amino acid fate later, but I just wanted to orient you with the general reaction. Now, it might seem very odd to you that we're going to use 1.5 or 3 halves of NADPH. And I want to clarify this by basically showing you the general mechanism of how these electrons get into this enzyme. But before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit about the structure of this particular enzyme. Okay. So first of all, this enzyme has a heme B in it. So that's what this molecule is right here. This is heme B. Of course, that's iron protoporphyrin 9. And the heme B, of course, is going to chelate this iron 3 plus or this ferric iron in the center of the porphyrin ring. And the iron is going to be what activates the molecular oxygen. So notice one of the substrates are two molecular oxygens. And actually the heme is going to play a role in activating those molecules. Okay, also if we were basically to take an axis like this, so if we take an axis right here, right through the iron and through these two carbons right here, and we rotate it 90 degrees, basically what we've done is we've rotated the heme sort of on its side. So remember, these nitrogens right here are chelating the iron in the center, but if we rotate 90 degrees, we can take a look at the axial positions, which are basically going in the vertical direction in this picture right here. And from the bottom, there's a cysteine residue thiolate, a cysteine in the deprotonated state, and it's going to chelate the ferric iron from the bottom, and then from the top, that's where the molecular oxygen is going to come in and bind. And notice, just like in the case of all hemes, when it comes in, it's going to come in at some angle with respect to the planar porphyrin ring. Okay, so that's one thing that's in the active site. There's also a molecule right here called tetrahydrobiopterin. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute, so we'll come back to that. What I want to do is basically tell you that nitric oxide synthase, number one, can exist as a cytosolic enzyme or a membrane bound enzyme, depending on which one you're talking about. But more importantly, it is a homodimer. It's a homodimer, and what that means is that it has two identical subunits that come together to make the enzyme, okay? And part of the function of this tetrahydrobiopterin is to stabilize this enzyme in the homodimer form. Okay, that's one of the functions of tetrahydrobiopterin. Okay, but really what I want to do now is to kind of discuss the other functions of tetrahydrobiopterin. What they've recently discovered is this molecule is actually not directly involved in the catalysis. Okay, what I have here is basically part of a research paper. Okay, and I want to give credit to these guys. These are the authors right here of this particular research paper, so I'm not just taking this out of nowhere. This is mutational analysis of the tetrahydrobiopterin binding site in inducible nitric oxide synthase. And in this section right here, in this little segment of the paper, they go into some of the many functions of THBP in the active site. Now, if you look at some of the, the older proposed mechanisms, they'll they'll show the nitric, or excuse me, they'll show the tetrahydrobiopterin as being uh, part of the electron donation system in general. 
Now it turns out that they've sort of disproven this to an extent because what they found is that this molecule of tetrahydrobiopterin is actually nowhere near uh, the place where oxygen is activated. So what they've determined is that it's too far away from the, the heme to participate in direct oxygen activation. But what the tetrahydrobiopterin does is it basically provides some structural effects like stabilizing the homodimer and then it also provides some electronic effects for the enzyme. Um, for example, um, Number one, it slows the binding of carbon monoxide a hundredfold. So keep in mind when we look back up at this heme B, recall from maybe some other videos or other knowledge that hemoglobin or anything that has heme, right, and even cytochrome C oxidase and things like that, heme is really good at binding carbon monoxide even more so than oxygen. So part of what the tetrahydrobiopterin does is it slows the binding of carbon monoxide. It also prevents the bi binding of bulky ligands like DTT, nitrosoalkanes, and things like that to the heme. And also it provides an increase in arginine affinity. Okay, so basically by allowing Allowing arginine to bind more easily, it facilitates the reaction. Okay. Um, also, just like in the case of the P450 mechanism, we're going to generate a ferrous oxygen complex, and it turns out that the THBP increases the reactivity of the ferrous oxygen complex 70 fold. And you can go into this research paper, you can Google this and look at all of the various functions that this does. But all in all, what the tetrahydrobiopterin does is it increases the reactivity of the enzyme and it also stabilizes the structure of the enzyme, allowing the reaction to proceed as planned. Okay. What they've also determined is also that um, if you look at this mechanism, you'll see there's a lot of free radicals that we form, including nitric oxide. But the other free radicals are far more dangerous. And so what they've determined is that also what the tetrahydrobiopterin does is it can kind of catch any um, free radicals that try to escape before the mechanism's over. Okay, so this tetrahydrobiopterin can quench free radicals. What they found is that if you get this enzyme and you deplete the system of tetrahydrobiopterin, you get production of free radicals more often. So that's part of what led scientists to realize that part of its function is to definitely um, quench the free radicals that try to escape the enzyme. Okay, And if a free radical does manage to escape the enzyme, we have other enzymes to deal with those, and we'll do those in other videos. We take L-arginine, react it with two molecular oxygens and electrons from NADPH, and we get citrulline and nitric oxide. But what I want to do now is talk a little bit about uh, how the electrons get into this enzyme. If you remember from the cytochrome P450 videos, we talked about how P450s have another enzyme that goes with them called cytochrome P450 reductase. And with the cytochrome P450 reductase, you had electrons that flowed from NADPH, and then that transferred two electrons into flavin adenine dinucleotide, and then that could transfer electrons one at a time to flavin mononucleotide, and then the ultimate last stop of those electrons would be the heme, specifically heme B, in the center of the active site. Okay, so remember, two electrons flow from NADPH to FAD, and then the remaining electron transfers are just one at a time. Okay, now this part right here, all this, the FMN you know, through the NADPH. This was all stuff that was catalyzed by P450 reductase. But the actual part that the P450 contained was just the heme B. And so what we would say about P450 is it was dependent on an external source of electrons. It was dependent on electrons that come from P450 reductase. But it turns out that in the case of nitric oxide synthase, Although these electron transfers are identical, it's all sustained by the same enzyme. So the reductase domain of nitric oxide synthase is actually a part of nitric oxide synthase. It doesn't need like a nitric oxide synthase reductase or anything like that. So the electrons come in through the nitric oxide synthase's reductase domain, the electrons then go to the heme B, which is part of the oxygenase domain. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do two successive monooxygenations of um, what was 
arginine, and that's going to give us citrulline and nitric oxide. So we have a reductase domain that does all this stuff, and then oxygen activation and hydroxylation is done by the oxygen, uh, oxygenase domain. Okay, So hopefully that gives you a little bit of intuition about the structure of this enzyme. Now what I want to do is talk a little bit about the other types of nitric oxide synthesis that we have. Okay, So we have two cytosolic nitric oxide synthesis. So these, are, these are ones that exist in the intracellular fluid. Those are inducible nitric oxide synthase and neuronal nox, nitric oxide synthase. Inducible nitric oxide synthase is the version that's used um, by white blood cells, so cells of the immune system to provide defense against pathogens. So they do this process. And then you also have neuronal nitric oxide synthase, which is used by usually postsynaptic neurons to communicate with presynaptic neurons. Okay, And there's other things that can be done as well. For example, um, there's a process known as long-term potentiation. That's a fancy way of saying learning. And it turns out that to learn something, you need to have glutamate bind to an NMDA receptor. Well, when, when the postsynaptic neuron releases nitric oxide, it goes back to the presynaptic neuron. Nitric oxide diffuses into the cell, okay, and then it causes the release of more glutamate, okay, and therefore you facilitate more long-term potentiation, okay. And by the way, something I'll also mention, um, in fact, let me do it right now. One thing that's also important about nitric oxide synthase is that if you look at the structure of this, okay, it's not totally apparent when you first look at it, but this molecule right here is actually pretty hydrophobic. Um, even though it has two electronegative atoms, note that those electronegative atoms are fairly close in electronegativity mu values, right? If you look at the the um, mu values that you can get probably from a general chemistry textbook, they're pretty close to each other. So there is technically a dipole moment here on this molecule, but it's not a very big one. So overall, this molecule is fairly hydrophobic. Okay, And so as a result of that, it can cross membranes. So if you have a membrane right here, so this is the extracellular fluid. It could be a synapse. It could be the blood or something like that. And this is the intracellular fluid. It turns out that nitric oxide synthase, okay, it can go ahead through extracellular fluids. Of course, it's made inside a cell. But once it gets into the extracellular fluid, it could go and then cross in through the cell without a transporter. And that's because it is so hydrophobic. Okay. So having said that, there's one more type of nitric oxide synthase, and that's called endothelial nitric oxide synthase. This is the type of nitric oxide synthase that's made um, in endothelial cells that line your blood vessels. So it turns out that um, scientists used to think that um, the blood vessel lining cells were kind of biologically inactive tissues, but that could not be farther from the truth. They're very, very active. And one of the ways they keep blood flowing through your veins and arteries and so forth whenever um, you don't have an injury is they secrete nitric oxide and they make it using this endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And so what the nitric oxide is able to do is it's able to diffuse into the skull, or excuse me, into the smooth muscle cells that surround the blood vessel walls, and it ultimately causes them to relax. And so the blood vessel dilates and basically allows more blood flow and decreases the blood pressure. Okay. So ultimately what nitric oxide is able to do is it's able to activate an enzyme, okay, and which is an enzyme that produces this molecule right here. This molecule, by the way, this is 3 prime, 5 prime cyclic guanosine monophosphate or cyclic GMP. And the enzyme that makes this, the enzyme that makes this is called guanolate cyclase. So what it does is it takes a molecule of GTP, okay, takes a molecule of GTP. In the process, it will cleave off a pyrophosphate, and you end up with this molecule, cyclic GMP. And the enzyme that does this, I'll do this in blue, this is called guanolate, guanolate cyclase. And guanolate cyclase has a heme group on it. Um, and when nitric oxide binds to that heme, it activates guanolate cyclase and causes this reaction to proceed. So that's the way nitric oxide exerts most of its effects. It binds to a guanolate cyclase and you get increased concentrations of cyclic GMP inside the cell. 
Okay, so when you get this increased cyclic GMP, what that does is it causes a closure of calcium channels, okay, and so calcium can no longer influx to the inside of the cell, but it also activates potassium channels, which causes potassium to efflux from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And so overall, what that causes is more hyperpolarization. So more hyperpolarization of cells, okay, to make them more inactive. Also, what, what cyclic GMP does is it tends to activate um, this enzyme right here called myosin light chain phosphatase. And so what you have to realize about smooth muscle is their, their, their muscle contraction is quite a bit different than skeletal muscle. So maybe you've learned a lot about skeletal muscle and maybe we'll have a whole video one day on smooth muscle contraction. But in order for smooth muscle to contract, they have to have their myosin heads, their myosin light chains phosphorylated. So their myosin light chain heads have to be phosphorylated. So what cyclic GMP does is it causes an activation of myosin light chain phosphatase. So the phosphatase activity of this enzyme hydrolyzes off the phosphate, and so you, what you get is a dephosphorylated myosin light chain. And what that does is it inactivates the, skeletal, the smooth muscle contraction, and so what you get is smooth muscle relaxation and the blood vessels dilate. Okay, so hopefully this is starting to give, get you a, a good picture of nitric oxide synthase. So obviously it makes nitric oxide um, using any of these types of nitric oxide synthase. And the nitric oxide causes an activation of guanylate cyclase. And so you get a, an increase in cyclic GMP. And that, of course, relaxes smooth muscles and hyperpolarizes membranes. Okay, but now to really get a good understanding of this particular enzyme, we of course have to look at its organic mechanism, okay? And to an extent, this is also an inorganic mechanism also, okay? So by the way, just to remind you, this right here, this is the electron flow through the enzyme. But unlike cytochrome P450, uh, this particular enzyme does not need an external electron protein source. Okay, the reductase domain is built into the nitric oxide synthase. So the electrons come in from NADPH, reduce FAD, and then FAD transfers electrons one at a time to FMN. FMN transfers electrons one at a time to heme B. Okay, so this is the flow of electrons in nitric oxide synthase. It's self-sufficient in terms of electron flow. Let's look at the mechanism. So up here to the top, okay, basically we start with L-arginine right here. And by the way, this iron in the ferric state, note that it's, it's this iron right here. Of course, I didn't include the heme porphyrin ring system around it or the cysteine residue, okay, for obvious reasons. I don't want this to get crowded, but understand that this porphyrin ring does surround the iron along with this cysteine thiolate. So don't, don't go thinking this is just a non-heme iron. It's a heme iron. Okay, so the first part of the mechanism is, of course, substrate binding. So the arginine is allowed into the active site. Once the arginine is allowed into the active site, okay, this electron comes in from, from the FMN to the heme, and it reduces the ferric iron into the ferrous state, at Fe2+. As soon as this happens, um, the iron will now bind molecular oxygen. And just remember, when it binds the oxygen, that oxygen comes in at some angle, which we'll label theta. And you could look to see what that angle is approximately. Okay? So now the ferrous iron is interacting with the molecular oxygen. Now an electron transfer is going to occur from the iron 2 plus to the molecular oxygen. So this electron is going to come in here and it's going to reduce molecular oxygen into a superoxide molecule. Okay, notice this arrow I drew is a fish hook arrow because it's just a simple one electron transfer. Remember that when you have one electron transfers, you do a fish hook arrow. If you had a full-fledged nucleophile, you would draw it as a full arrow, but that's not what this is. Okay, this is a one electron transfer, and now we have this superoxide molecule that is interacting electrostatically with the iron 3 plus. At this point, another electron is going to come in from FMN, and that's going to ultimately reduce 
this superoxide to where it has two negative charges, and then one of the negative charges will pick up a proton from solution, and that's going to give us this peroxy species. So this is the iron peroxy species that we've seen in the P450 mechanism. And if you've seen the P450 mechanism, you may be able to guess the next step. So what's going to happen now is this iron 3 plus is going to donate two electrons onto the oxygen atom that's proximal to the iron. And when that happens, what's going to happen is you're going to get loss of this hydroxyl group. And as it leaves, it's going to pick up a proton from the arginine in the active site. So in this step, you're going to get loss of water. So loss of H2O, just like we saw in the P450 cycle. So now you have basically this iron 5 plus with a chelated oxide. Now, technically, it's an oxide, and this is a coordinate covalent bond. But what we typically do in these mechanisms is we draw them such that the iron 5 plus is in a double bond to the oxygen. This basically allows the mechanism to be seen a little bit more easily. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. Okay, so from here, what we're going to have is we're going to have a hydrogen abstraction. So this is a radical mechanism that you probably talked about in organic. So what's going to happen is you're going to homolytically cleave one of these bonds, or in other words, one electron will be transferred onto the iron 5 plus, reducing it into the 4 plus state. The other part of this electron will come out and do a coupling with this hydrogen right here. And that, of course, forces one of these electrons onto the nitrogen atom of the arginine that's in the active site. And so what that does is it creates a radical electron, which I'll circle in purple, a radical electron on the arginine. And now we have this hydroxide that is chelated to the iron 4 plus of the heme. So now this lone electron is going to couple with this hydroxide ion. So one of the electrons from the hydroxide will come here and couple. The other electron will go back onto this iron 4 plus, therefore reducing it back to its resting state in the 3 plus ferric state. So this is part of the heme. Again, just remember that. Also, one thing that's important to realize is notice how we transferred two electrons in right? We transferred one right here. This was the second electron. And then the first one came to reduce the ferric iron to the ferrous. So notice if we go back to the net reaction of this, we use 1.5 NADPH. Notice that one NADPH transfers two electrons. So that means we're going to transfer a total of how many? You guessed it, three electrons. So basically, we have already We've already basically used two of them, so you can imagine we're only going to need one more to complete the catalytic cycle of nitric oxide synthase. Okay, So once again, here's the third electron. So this is the third electron that's going to come in here, and it's going to reduce the ferric iron into the ferrous state. Okay, The next step is molecular oxygen binding. So this is the second molecule of molecular oxygen that comes in. It binds electrostatically to the iron. And then we're going to get one electron transfer from the ferrous iron to one of the atoms of molecular oxygen. And that's going to generate a superoxide and give us the ferric state of the iron in the heme. And of course, the superoxide is shown right here. So now what's going to happen is we're going to deviate a little bit from the P450 mechanism. This is really the point where it's going to start to get a little bit unintuitive, and you sort of have to see this once before it really makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to do these steps in a different color. I'm going to do them in red just to show you that this is where it kind of deviates from the P450 mechanism. Okay, so what's going to happen is this electron is going to come over here and couple with electrons from this double bond right here. So one of these electrons is going to come over here and couple right here. The other one is going to come up onto this nitrogen atom, okay? And that gives us this um, intermediate as shown right here. So what's going to happen now is something that's a little bit unintuitive. You've probably never seen anything like it before. Uh, this carbon right here and this nitrogen, the bond between them is actually going to break. And when it does, it's going to come out here and attack this oxygen right there. What that's going to do is it's going to force this bond right here to break. So this bond comes out here and abstracts this hydrogen, and that forces the nitrogen-oxygen bond to form. Okay, 
So you get basically a six electron movement, and that generates three important things. Number one, we get this L-citrulline right here. This is L-citrulline. You get the ferric iron with the hydroxide coordinated here, and you get nitric oxide. So this is nitric oxide. And then, of course, we know from the P450 mechanism that this hydroxide right here will then go and pick up a proton from solution, and that generates the water, and the water will leave the active site, and of course that regenerates the ferric, not the ferric heme iron that's in the active site. Okay, so right here, these guys, these are your final products of nitric oxide synthase. Okay, now nitric oxide. Um, again, we saw the functions for it. It can be used to uh, protect against pathogens. It can be used to communicate within the synapse of neurons. Um, it can be used to dilate blood vessels. Those are some of its main functions. But what I want to do right now is talk a little bit about some of the problems that can arise with nitric oxide. And we touched on this in another video. Um, nitric oxide is a radical. Okay, so if we look at its structure, this is nitric oxide right here. So here is the lone pair, here's the lone electron on the nitrogen. Now you can imagine if you have, you know, some kind of, you know, if you have some kind of other radical that comes in contact with nitric oxide, you could get a coupling reaction. So what you can get is you can get maybe a superoxide molecule. So you have this right here. So this is of course the oxygen with a negative charge. And then you have this oxygen right here that's neutral. So what can happen is is these molecules can couple. So this electron can come out here and couple with this one right there. And so what you get is a non-enzymatic reaction that produces something like this. Something like this. And this molecule has a special name. It's called peroxynitrite. Now ordinarily peroxynitrite would be perceived as bad, and in fact it is, um, if you have lots of peroxynitrite floating around, that's not a good thing. You've got to find a way to get rid of it. But it turns out that there actually is a purpose of a molecule like this. It's in something called respiratory burst. What essentially respiratory burst is, is it's when an immune cell releases a dangerous concoction of free radicals into a particular location, and you get all sorts of free radical reactions, and those free radicals are used to kill things like bacteria. Okay, it turns out that nitric oxide is made by those uh, white blood cells. That's the inducible nitric oxide synthase. And superoxide is also made. That's done by NADPH phagocyte oxidase. And so when these guys get in close proximity, they couple. So what's important to realize about this reaction is it's non-enzymatic. It's non-enzymatic. So this coupling reaction is spontaneous. It has a negative delta G, but it's non-enzymatic. So peroxynitrite is dangerous for a number of reasons. But one of the main reasons it's dangerous is that this nitrogen right here is extremely electrophilic. Notice that if you look at this nitrogen, I'll do this in, in blue, there are dipole moments that point away from the nitrogen towards these oxygens. And so also, the nitrogen is very unshielded. There's no carbon group over here. There's no hydrogen. So that means that if you have some nucleophile in the vicinity, it is very prone to attacking that nitrogen. And you could get some kind of adduct, or you could even get a total nucleophilic acyl substitution type of mechanism. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that nitric oxide is not all good, but the body tends to use it um, to kill other pathogens through respiratory burst. Okay, and that's done again by inducible nitric oxide synthase. Okay, so I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on this enzyme. Um, just remember the mechanism and the total reaction is it's going to use three electrons from NADPH, L-arginine, two molecular oxygens, and you'll get out citrulline and nitric oxide. See you in the next video.